musicians out in the hall, have a seat. Next speaker's about to start up. Next talk, uh, I, I can't explain this title, but Weasel is going to talk about dissipation of hackers in the enterprise, something about people engineering. Thank you. Um, okay, so uh, maybe it helps to start with where this talk began. Uh, I've been doing security for a very, very long time and I've worked in a lot of different facets of the industry and in various types of companies. And uh, last year, or yeah, this past summer at DEF CON, uh, I was having breakfast with a lot, a lot of old uh, comrades from some of my earliest companies. And one of the things that we noticed was that as people were getting, yes, oh, oh sorry, that was a question. As people were um, getting sucked out of, out of the enterprise to move into other parts of the industry, um, they weren't being backfilled. Uh, they were, they would just, it just seemed like that the percentage of people that really understood how the systems worked in the company that they worked in seemed to dissipate over time. And uh, what I wanted to do is go over a few of the scenarios that have kind of maybe created that, um, that uh, uh, phenomenon from happening and maybe talk about some ways that maybe we can go back to that and why would we want to go back to that and I'm not saying that we should go 100% back to the old model where you have basically a Bell Labs in every company because that's not practical and it doesn't make sense but where we are today I think there's a lot of uh, expenditure and resource loss that happens in very large companies uh, because of what I'm going to discuss here. Um, because this is highly opinion driven and this is just based on discussing with countless former colleagues and interviewing, uh, probably need to rename it to this uh, because I'm probably going to get hit with a lot of balls today. And wow, don't quote me on that. Uh, wow, I can write my own jokes. Um, so. Let me start with a clarification on what I'm referring to as hackers. This is the, I'm talking about the classical definition. Uh, it's kind of the accepted definition in Europe. It never really changed. Uh, Europe never had the crazy media surge in around 2000 to 2003 that really kind of made the common usage of the term hacker as being someone who breaks into systems. And I'm going for more of the more older definition, which is someone who actually breaks systems to see how they work, uh, regardless of their, uh, what color hat they wear. Um, just a quick slide about myself to kind of just show the diversity of, of my background. Um, I've worked in mostly really large companies and I've ducked in and out of technology companies over the past 25 years. Uh, yes, this does represent 25 years of experience, so I do actually tend to stay with companies for a little while too. So I kind of get to know the cultures of these companies a little bit more rather than just getting in getting some, a little bit of work done, getting some cool projects done, and then finding a better job and moving on. That usually takes, uh, I usually follow it all the way through to burnout and ha self-hatred before I actually move to a new company. <coughs> so currently I'm actually working for a small startup in Berlin. Well, actually that's a large startup, a 250 employee uh, company in Berlin that focuses on uh, technology. And no, I don't sound German, I know. Um, okay, so am I beating a dead horse here? Because this topic does actually come, has come up in the past. Uh, the most uh, important one would be a paper by FX who wrote it in 2004 when this phenom phenomenon first started happening where he just felt like there weren't new hackers coming up. He was noticing that the, the age of conference attendance was raising. Uh, and it, it, this, it wasn't, there weren't new young people coming into the security conferences that he was attending. Uh, but he was more focusing on the problem being that the uh, older generation of hackers and security experts were not letting go of the old iterations that they kept going through and allowing uh, the new generations to come in and define really what they're going to solve for society rather than here just keep continuing this fight because this fight is going to take forever. I mean we're still arguing password links. I mean do we really want to let the next generation of hackers be doing that for a living? No, that's, that's dooming them to a, a bullet in the head from, by their own accord. Um, so he was just really trying to iterate that, or, or basically emphasize that at some point you got to kind of let go and become a mentor and let the new people innovate. Uh, one of the big problems that we have in the industry is people become public speakers uh, in the industry and it actually starts to become part of their career. And as, as you notice, uh, those of you who have been going to conferences for many years will notice that the average speaker is actually continuing to be the same speaker and they're getting older. And I think there's a conflict of interest there that um, 
People are too busy focusing on furthering their own careers with these talks rather than actually disclosing knowledge. So, I mean, maybe that's what the schmoo balls are for, the people that are actually getting up here and iterating on things that aren't important anymore, but it's making sexy talks. Um, but that's, again, that's not what this discussion is about. This discussion is about uh, how do we, do we need to look back and say, maybe we need to have deeper skill, more skill uh, in enterprises solving problems internally rather than uh, turning externally for expertise every time we have a problem. Um, so, how things used to be, organizations used to be uh, self-sufficient. Uh, they, again, you kind of had that Bell Labs model where even the companies that weren't turning out research actually had these crazy guys in, in basements in every company. There's always a basement. Even, even buildings that didn't have basements, they would dig basements for these guys so that they could stick them in there. And, and these would be brilliant people. And these were the guys that the people coming out of college said, I want to work for that guy because they know that they're not going to get that level of knowledge anywhere else. Um, and you know, these, these, it wasn't an anomaly. It wasn't like that one really smart guy in that department on that floor, but it was a whole floor of people that were really brilliant, and then you kind of had the people that were under them that were a little less brilliant that were actually executing on their, on their, on their, uh, on their, their brainchilds. Um, but again, that kinda, we got away from that because it's extremely expensive to do. Um, there was a lot of risks taken, so if you didn't have a guy that really understood a problem that needed to be solved, uh, they would sometimes take a stab in the dark and do it anyway, and there'd be huge risk taken because there was no ex expert on that specific subject that could be consulted. Because consultancy in, in, the, in the 90s really wasn't heavily available. You didn't have experts on certain areas that were just easily accessible. Now you can contact one of the many uh, very reputable uh, security consulting firms, and they're gonna have at least one guy on staff that really understands that stuff that you can get the information from. That's great, but I'm not a big fan of having someone who has the interest of making money by giving you the most financially uh, rewarding solution for them and making the best decision for the company that you're trying to do. So you always, almost always have to take everything that you get back from these guys with a grain of salt. There's a few exceptions, but it, it's just the way it is. Uh, a great ex example was a couple of years ago, the company that I was working for had a huge uh, potential breach on their uh, web platform. Uh, some bad configurations and a bad push to production uh, actually created a situation where somebody could get into the database. And so what I did was I pulled offline quickly to triage because it was basically the database was just, see it was just leaking. It wasn't a matter of it being a, a covert problem. It was a really bad configuration problem and a really bad uh, piece of code running. And it was very easy for someone to find these databases and leak it. So I took it offline. And our partners that we're using for CDN, which was one of the major CDN vendors, was on the phone with us within an hour trying to sell us DDoS protection. And this wasn't even a DDoS issue. So these reputable companies that make big names with capital letter A's that do CDN work, and I won't name vendors, are, their motivation is to make money. Their motivation is not to help you, even though they tell you that it is. And yes, you can say, I should be jaded as a security professional and, and know this, but you know, it's, it's still bullshit. You shouldn't have to go through it. Um, Right, so, so one of the other great things about the old hierarchy is that you actually built a hierarchy based on capability in, these, in, these, uh, old, in this old model. Um, and decision making was actually done that were very technical and it wasn't always bringing in the lawyer saying how much risk is involved in making this decision? Uh, can we afford it? Uh, is widget XYZ that has to go live on the website, is that more important than losing customer data that the customer may not find out that the data was even lost? You shouldn't even be having that conversation. The customer data should always be protected. So that was, that was a good thing that happened back then. But you always had personality conflicts and you always had job entrenchment. You had a lot of guys that would come in and just build, themselves, build job security into their environment because no one outside of them who governed them could, could really say that they were doing it until it was too late. Um, so then dot com happened. And uh, all of a sudden there was VC everywhere and everyone was uh, throwing money at these little startup ideas. If, I mean, if you were technically smart and you're connected to the right person, you could start a company and you could have a million bucks to just start a very small consulting consultancy firm all the way up to 100 million because you had the next big idea after the first couple of successes. Uh, Netscape really kicked that off. I think Netscape was the first really big IPO in the dot-com area. And uh, as soon as that happened, there was just money coming in like crazy. So it started creating, it kind of had an effect on the, on the industry and started having all these companies that say, I don't care what I've got to pay, I've got to have good people. So they were spending top dollar for anything. And there's no way 
these, co these enterprises could hold on to these people. Uh, so they had to go. I mean, it's how much you had to go. It's like given the option of, okay, I've worked up to $50,000 a year over the past 10 years for this, small, for this big enterprise, and here's somebody that's going to throw 80 bucks, 80000 a year in my lap just to come and hang out. And I've, I've known people that were dropped 160 k with no experience because they needed somebody very specifically for that job. And that's good. That's, that's free market. That should be happening. But it was happening at such a grand scale that it just kind of created, you know, like when you, when you siphon gasoline, uh, you just really the, the 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 initial pressure you put on on the on the hose is to just start this the seepage, but when you turned it off, it keeps going. And this is what happened. So it started that first pull, and it actually kind of created an environment where enterprises became the breeding ground for people who went to work for the really cool tech companies and the really cool uh, consultancy firms. And there was no way for enterprises to hold on to these people. Um, and then certification uh, craze came. I'm not going to say anything negative about certifications here. I've done that through my countless talks over the past 10 years. Uh, I think there are some good benefits of certifications, so don't get me wrong on that. Uh, but it basically was a drop-in cred uh, credential for companies who needed to start paying somebody some, a decent amount of money to come in and work because they couldn't find anybody to fill these old positions. So considering that, you know, I dropped out of school because I was on my third semester of COBOL in CompSci, and this was in the 90s when no one was deploying COBOL. And it's just universities, for the most part, weren't able to actually offer degrees doing what people were doing that day. Um, so you, you couldn't get people from universities, so you had to find something that would actually allow you to at least put a, a low bar on people, and certifications kind of fit that bill. But the problem is, as soon as people were, they were uh, companies were hiring people at higher income, uh, because they had a cert, you had people being attracted to the certifications that didn't have any of the expertise that went with it. And the, uh, the vetting and the, the validation that goes along with most certifications, like saying you have to be vetted by somebody that's got five years experience, it's just bullshit. You just get somebody to write an email and you can get the cert. So there's you know, countless CISSPs with zero experience. <clears throat> and actually, I think if you get some of the, the um, uh, certification companies where you go and pay... Uh, you know, $5,000 and they, you go to class for a week and then at the end of the week you go take the test, uh, some of the seedier ones will actually do the vetting for you and say that, yes, this person has worked for four years, so <clears throat> it's not good. Um, and then came the compliancy craze, so HIPAA and uh, COBIT and all those uh, compliances that came in. Uh, all of a sudden, companies were actually being required to deal with a lot of the security problems that they weren't dealing with because of this, this vacuum. And while, yes, some, some low-hanging fruits came along and you could deal with things, some people were at, you're at least finally getting minimum password links into, into systems, but the problem was that they were shorter than they probably needed to be. Um, companies weren't quite understanding or at least weren't willing to understand that the redistribution of wealth or the redistribution of resources to deal with compliance was not a one-to-one -one value benefit in security. So you basically had a company that would have one million a year to spend on security and they would cut it in half, say, spend 500,000 on compliance, 500,000 on security. And while in, that's not necessarily horrible, uh, the problem is, is that we've iterated on that over the years and we keep doing that. And uh, when it comes down to budget cuts and low economies, we gotta cut money well, we can't cut compliance because we'll fall out of regulatory uh, compliance, so let's cut security. And that just kind of keeps happening, and it's kind of been seeping away from, from uh, getting, having these really good teams because there wasn't the money anymore in these companies to actually have really good teams. And, and again, this isn't, this isn't a black and white discussion here. This is a delta. It's kind of describing a delta that's happened over the years. It's, I'm not saying that there's not really skilled people in enterprises. I know very skilled people in enterprises. I'm just saying the, the saturation is gone. Um, yeah, I think I've just covered that on the, the shifting of finances. Um, yeah. Okay, and then, then becomes the other really big problem for having really skilled people in enterprises. Not every one of us can get up and dance on a stage by themselves. Not everyone is an extrovert. And HR policies that have to deal with peer reviews and have to deal with uh, everything that uh, creates a great employee and somebody that's a team player and all of this stuff doesn't necessarily find really skilled people who really understand things. And some of the most brilliant people that come up with some of those brilliant ideas and solve so many problems on such low income or so much, such, such low cost are the people that are stuck in that basement that was dug 10 years ago 
uh, but no one's listening to them because they're, they're, they've filtered them out through uh, excessive uh, HR policy iteration. The other problem with HR policies is the uh, concept of job grades, and job grades have clamps on them on income, and it's really hard to sit in a job really talented and be at the top end of your, your salary bu bubble and not be able to move. Um, so that's another thing that causes this problem. Um, HR policies really do need to change to where there's a way for people who may be an, an introvert or may not fit the bill because they don't, uh, they're not a cheerleader in the company or whatever, uh, can actually still be considered a valued employee. And then the other problem is, uh, this kind of touches on what was discussed in the previous talk, is that uh, risk is kind of looked at at a superficial or at a top level. So we need to have a certain risk level for each individual item that we look at, but no one's actually doing the compound investigation of risk. Uh, so I honestly think that there are a lot of costs that are going into enterprises to deal with those undefined and unknown risks that seep out of the bottom of the risk matrix because no one's looking at them compoundly. They're not looking at Three, list, list, uh, three risks on top of each other. So you've got three uh, risks that are you know, medium level or low level, and they overlap by about 80%, you're eventually gonna have this big gaping hole through all these risks that's actually causing a huge loss to the company. Uh, and no one's measuring that because they're not expected to measure that, and it's hard to measure. Uh, but it's happening, and I think that's where a lot of money is going, and I think that's where a lot of the money that's going that should be paying for really skilled people in the enterprise. Um, and, of course, this is kind of a phenomenon that's happening, I think, in the industry as well. And this is, this is a, a continuation of the evolution of security software. There used to be uh, that you had security groups that ha had to have this huge uh, technology footprint of understanding because there were no tools that did it. They had to write their own tools, and if they did have a tool that did it, it did a very specific thing. So you didn't have things uh, like in the forensic space. You didn't have, like in case, you had people that knew how to dig through logs all day. Um, you don't necessarily need that, but we're kind of creating these... Uh, because of these very specialized tools, uh, eventually you're going to run out of tools that you can write or the, 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 the huge leap that you get between each iteration of the tool gets smaller and smaller. So you're buying the next version or the next generation of tools, you're only getting minor benefits from it. So as, when it comes to carving out the costs of enterprises, uh, it, we tend to funnel or limit the scope of what people do down to a very small subset, and now you have people that are focusing on very finite things. And the problem with that is that's actually creating a huge amount of burnout. You've got a few people that really like it. There's people that like sitting there looking at an IDS console and writing uh, 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 incident reports all, all day. That's not very many people that enjoy that. That's not a fulfilling job. That's not an exciting job. You, there, there should be more scope of what people are actually able to do in their job, and, and we're kind of moving away from that. Uh, a good example is if you guys just go do a search on, on certain keywords and, and monster, those of you who have been in the job market for 10 plus years in this industry, used to you could go search for CISSP and you would see nothing but job postings for security engineer or something like that. Now you see uh, very specific job postings and it'll be like an incident response uh, or incident response to specific uh, IDS tools or something like that. And it's funneling down into these very finite jobs and that's just, that's not, Benefit. That's not utilizing those are very intelligent people that are in these roles because they're not being allowed to touch multiple components. Um, and then a quick overgeneralization is uh, through blind iteration, uh, we've trained enterprises to be targets for professional services and security gadgets. Consultants want to throw your balls now. Um, but we can counter uh, much of this uh, by welcoming hackers back into the enterprise. So. Unfortunately, this is only a 20-minute talk, and I can go on this for multiple hours and put all of you to sleep. I guarantee you I can make every one of you a mouth breather within three hours. Um, but the problem is, is I, I think the enterprises really need to start having these conversations, and I think the, uh, you guys that are not in management, you need to start filtering this idea back up through your management teams and say, hey, why can't I spend half of my day on the third Friday of every month just working on whatever I want with no expectations? Uh, why can't I actually proactively go look for compromise in our systems rather than waiting for IDSs to trigger? Why can't I do these things? Because there is a benefit. Uh, the, obviously, the answer to that back is weak management. It says, well, if we find a problem, we have to deal with it. Uh, you, that you're not going to get back and get out of, and maybe you need to leave the enterprise and move on. Or <laughs> but... Um, I think, there, I think there's this discussion needs to happen. I mean, just at a very high level, there's a lot of things that can actually be done to make 
enterprise is welcoming to people who want to work. And again, I'm not preaching against startups. I'm not preaching against uh, consultancies. I think they very much have a, have a space. I just think we depend too heavily on external resources when making or when doing things for the enterprise. Um, so maybe some ideas is, uh, you know, reduce the scope of, of what your company or what your group does. Uh, do we really need to be doing all of these various things for security when there is no real benefit? So one thing that happens, I think, is iteration without refactoring. Uh, you'll, you'll find a lot of groups and enterprises that are still running and still running under this exact same model they were running under 15 years prior, where they're still caring about um, uh, like when they have an incident, they take the whole site offline other than maybe there's somebody needs to be thinking, okay, when you have an incident and if there's no one being impacted by this, maybe we need to stay online and continue to make money as an e-shop and then we deal with the problem on the side. You know, no one's rethinking these things at a new level. So I think it becomes, I think you do, with that constant iteration, you keep improving old methods, but you're not rethinking what you're doing to see if maybe you could actually make it more efficient by doing it better. Um, and allocate hack, you know, hacker or hack time or maker time or whatever you want, like I was saying. It's very rewarding. Uh, one of the problems with enterprises is that there's so many projects that are driven. They're long-term projects that have no reward, instant reward. Uh, I worked at a company that took 18 months to implement an IDS because of bureaucracy. Um, that's not a rewarding job being the implementer for that IDS because after 18 months you're going to be completely burned out and you haven't got a reward from actually doing anything. Uh, and so. You know, give people the chance to go out and actually make things and do stuff. You know, let them go and be, participate in open source projects. Let them open source something that you do. Open sourcing uh, tools that maybe that have been written inside, just, you know, make sure you strip out all the stuff that's uh, uh, proprietary to the company and then just open source it. My company open sources stuff all the time. And it's a huge benefit because especially if you're in a long, drawn out project that just by nature has to take a long time, somebody needs to feel like they completed something on a regular basis. And I don't believe that necessarily stripping those into little tiny iterations are rewarding. Uh, the, those of you who work in companies that use like agile development or something, uh, they do have rewards because you basically have stripped your, 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 your six month project into one, one week or two week chunks. And yeah, that's okay, great. I removed the comments from that file and I stopped putting passwords in that one file when I wrote that code. And that's not rewarding. That's what you should be doing anyway. Um, and you know, we've got to work with the HR programs. We've got to make sure HR stops filtering really good people out. Um, that's, that's one of my worst. I actually, I hate autopilot auto HR uh, companies that basically just implement tools because their competitor implemented a tool or implements a process because a competitor implemented a process and they're not really thinking. It's like they're brain dead and just doing horrible things. And it's like, oh, well, you know, uh, you, especially if you do uh, a peer review type uh, um, um, job review or periodic job review, if you've got a room full of 15 people that are, that one thumbs down from that per, from somebody in that room is gonna prevent somebody from getting a promotion or getting a pay raise, it's gonna happen, I guarantee it, especially if you're rattling cages and making change and improving things, because every time you improve something, you're gonna have at least two enemies from that because they failed at preventing you from improving it. Um, and then support for training. I mean, a uh, quick poll if you guys wanna participate. Um, how many of you, are fairly new and working for an enterprise and are getting paid to come to this conference. I mean, do you have less than, less than five years experience in, in your, I'm sorry? Oh, so there's probably 10 people. That's bullshit. I mean, there should be, the company should be sending more of their young people into the enterprise because that actually make, retains them. If I know, I mean, I've left or I've moved on to other companies because I knew that they would support my education more in the past. If you're not going to support my education, I'm not going to stay. Um, I'm not saying that I have to go to the most expensive conferences, but you need to at least acknowledge that just because that conference doesn't cover the main business of the company that I work for, it covers the main business of what you have me doing for your company. Um, yeah, I think that pretty much covers it. Uh, as I said, this is a huge talk that I've been working on that I've been working on for, for quite several months, and there's a lot of research data that goes into it. Uh, I am writing for the processions uh, that's going to be the follow-up. Uh, those of you that were here for the keynote know what I'm talking about, but there will be actually a publication of uh, extended versions of these slides, and I'm going to have all of my research and stuff like that, and I would love to get some feedback from, from you guys if you've actually tried to open these conversations up in your companies. Um, 
Yeah, so um, any questions or any comments, or am I completely off? Uh, yes, back here. So you said companies that are that are ROI or KPI driven or whatever, how would I do what? I didn't hear the second half of the question. Uh, make the argument stop or management. That's the hardest part. It's almost like this argument needs to be taken into like almost a consultant level that consults to the top debt level because it's so much easier to push these concepts down than it is to push them up. Um, it's, it's a really hard, hard discussion to have. And the only thing that you can do is it's data. Uh, the decision makers in enterprises really care about the charts. They, it's not so much what the argument is, but how good it looks on PowerPoint. And I've, I've seen initiatives fail that were equal initiatives fail in enterprises because one PowerPoint slide was all uh, monochrome like mine, and another one had pretty graphs and charts. Uh, it's, it comes to salesmanship. I, I don't think you're ever going to completely do a logical argument for that. Uh, and it's, it's all about how you sell it. And if you can find articles, I mean, it's one of those, it's one of those long games, especially if, if you're the one trying to do it, it's one of those long games that you have to play. You have to actually uh, start by feeding articles that cover the argument little by little over time and start opening those conversations and you find those little things that you can do and say, hey, why don't we just have once a quarter, why don't we have a half day uh, maker time where everybody works on whatever they want and then we just do a report on that. And, if, and if, if you do that in a focused way and actually generate value, someone will start listening because it really all comes down to numbers and numbers anyway, right? Any other questions? Yes. Right. Yep. Yep. So I'll try and summarize that in, in one or two sentences. So He's saying use the companies. This is what I call the startup mentality. I think a lot of the startups do this, and I think some of the bigger companies are actually really working to do that. Uh, the comment was in response to how do you d deliver ROI and things like that. Um, so Google does this really well. Uh, you, you mentioned 3M, and I wasn't aware 3M was, was still doing things like that, but it's proved that the innovation that comes from things like hack time actually generate product. So go through and do analysis on these companies that actually already implemented these and are successful from it. Uh, if you work for, I mean, one of the companies that I listed on there was a transportation company, and that's not going to be an innovative company for anything other than transportation. But if you can prove that the technology that you're implementing is actually, um, or the technology that you're coming up with and you're iterating on and innovating on can actually uh, help the company, then that's how you do it. So you just really go out into the marketplace and find the arguments for what you're doing. And am, am, I, am I time up? Or? Okay, all right. Well, I'll go ahead and leave it there. I'm going to be in the con. I'll be in the hallways. So uh, did you, were you going to ask a question? or? Yeah, real quick, and only a request. Since you're in the proceedings and you're recommending some of these, I don't want to say flashy graphics, but at least useful information, anything that you can put in there that we can take back Yep. to our management structure yep. would be fantastic. Absolutely, really. absolutely. That's, that's, that's the, goal of, uh, the goal of this talk originally. And uh, that, that was the goal of this talk originally, was to actually deliver that. It, the problem was is that we decided this talk was a 20-minute talk, and obviously I can't fit all that in there, but that will certainly be in the proceedings. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone.